Inconclusive wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, a vast federal budget, a resurgent Russia, and a rising China. Now might be a good time for the United States of America to reconsider at least certain aspects of its enormous global presence. So at least one foreign policy expert might be willing to suggest. The other says, not so fast. Shooting today at Dartmouth College, we have with us Dartmouth professors of government, Jennifer Lind and William Wolforth. Uncommon knowledge now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. An associate professor of government here at Dartmouth College, Jennifer Lind holds a BA from Berkeley, an MA from the University of California at San Diego, and a doctorate from MIT. Professor Lind's most recent book, Sorry States, Apologies in International Politics. The Daniel Webster Professor of Government at Dartmouth, William Wolforth, holds a BA from Beloit and an MA and PhD from Yale. His most recent book, World Out of Balance, International Relations Theory, and the challenge of American primacy. Jennifer, Bill, historian and foreign affairs expert George Kennan in 1948. Quote, we must be very careful when we speak of exercising leadership in Asia. We are deceiving ourselves when we pretend to have the answers to the problems of Asiatic peoples. Furthermore, we have about 50% of the world's wealth but only a little more than 6% of its population, we cannot fail to be the object of envy and resentment." Close quote. We don't know what we're doing in Asia, but we do know that we will elicit resentment. Fair assessment, Bill? It is uh, it's not an assessment that I would agree with today. I think today the U.S. presence in Asia is more of a stabilizing force than a force that is pushing others to push back against us. I think what we need to do today is think most carefully about what are the most important things we're doing in Asia and focus on those things instead of allowing ourselves to be pulled in other directions. You're with Kenan? Well, there's, there's a lot of things you might take exception to in the, in the quote, for example, talking about Asiatic peoples as if it's a... 1948, one, it was a, lo a long time ago. Sure, sure, but again, when I think of the peoples in Asia, I think of a a dynamic growing nation of China that has very strong rifts between another great power, Japan. I think of the trouble on the Korean Peninsula. And so the bundling it all together under Asiatic peoples is certainly not a good place to but start. Do, doesn't the change, wouldn't the change from 1948 to the present strengthen his argument for our, his argument is we should be cautious, limited engagement, we're likely to bungle, watch out. Is that not, would that argument not be stronger today? I, I think the United States has done something truly remarkable in Asia, demonstrating that we avoided a lot of bungling and led very successfully for the past half century. And the question is, can we continue with that kind of a system, the, the kind of system we created after World War II? Okay. Can that system continue? Let's do what we must do, which is whenever we talk about Asia, there's an issue that overhangs the whole conversation, which is Vietnam. So briefly at least, briefly, this is, dissertations have been written on this subject, but this is television. Briefly, let's sort out what we think may be the lessons of Vietnam. Dwight Eisenhower, talking about communism in Indochina in a 1954 press conference, quote, you have a row of dominoes set up, you knock over the first one, and what will happen to the last one is certainly that it will go over very quickly. So you could have the beginning of a disintegration that would have the most profound influences, close quote. Was Eisenhower right, Bill? No. No? Uh, I don't think so. I think what we learned in Vietnam was that uh, there are immense limits to power. And also, I think we learned also that sometimes the best strategy can be waiting, uh, out, uh, waiting your adversary out, uh, standing by and letting the local dynamics that of, often can self-limit the people that you're trying to contain, uh, let them work their wonders instead of having the United States necessarily uh, go in and try to nip them in the bud. So it was a mistake to go into Vietnam at all? You know, the, you talked about historians. There's a lot of new historical research on this. And, you know, 
historical what might have beens are always uh, f you know food for uh, parlor chatter, but I think there's a lot of evidence that suggests that there was a kind of middle road. There was a choice uh, early in the uh, in the engagement where the United States uh, uh, could have uh, ex extricated itself from support to the DM regime uh, without uh, suffering the reputational consequences it ultimately would have later. Okay, so that reputational consequences, Jennifer, you wrote a piece last year in which you wrote, quote, every time analysts call for war, they warn that inaction will jeopardize America's credibility. What is surprising is how little evidence there is for this view. We could have sat out Vietnam without any damage to our reputation as a world power in the Cold War. Well, well, frankly, when you look at what our allies wanted, they were not calling for this. So, so people who were arguing in the U.S., we have to go into Vietnam, otherwise the allies will lose faith in us. They weren't actually quoting the allies because the allies were deeply apprehensive about the U.S. getting involved in that war and, and performing the French wanted The seriously. French wanted us in, but only to the extent of saving their presence, of preserving Indochina for the, for the French empire. Isn't that right? Uh, well, again, the, when I talk about the, the credibility issue, it's do our NATO allies, which were the, the ones in, that were in people's minds the most at that moment, but also the allies in East Asia, the, the US-Japan alliance, the US-Korea alliance, uh, the argument that was being made was, we have to show our allies that, that we will fight. Right. And, but yet these same allies did not want us to be fighting in that war. The British never wanted anything to do with it from beginning to end. Uh, something that you see continuing across time, certainly. So, closing, go ahead, Bill. Well, I think there's a lesson there in that allies may have more faith in American security guarantees when America shows the capacity to focus on those alliances. If the United States thinks that in order to demonstrate its credibility to its allies, it needs to get involved everywhere, it actually may weaken itself, make itself less competent, less capable of defending the allies when push comes to shove. Okay. So. Let's go then from Vietnam to a little bit of theoretical work. And here we'll draw on Bill's piece last year in Foreign Affairs. Um, you argue, if I'm characterizing it correctly, that the United States should remain an unabashed, dominant power on the planet. Uh, Bill, this is a quotation from your piece in Foreign Affairs last year. The budgetary savings, you're pushing back against people who say that we could save money by cutting back our presence. The budgetary savings of lowering the United States international profile are debatable. And there is little evidence to suggest that an internationally engaged America provokes other countries to balance against it, becomes overextended, or gets dragged into unnecessary wars, close quote. So let's take each of those. The budget first. We now spend more on our military than the next eight powers combined. So I just did a little calculation here, and if we made sure that we spent more only than the next three powers combined, which would be Russia, China, and Saudi Arabia, we could save $280 billion a year. What's wrong with that? Well, there's nothing wrong with it except that at that level of funding, we probably couldn't sustain the strategy that we have been following uh, for the last 50, 60 years, which is essentially to secure allies in key regions, to make them um, uh, bulwarks of stability in the various regions, and in some sense, underwrite global stability, which benefits others, I grant you, but also benefits the United States. The current uh, projections are for defense to fall below 3% uh, of GDP uh, in the next five-year interval. About 4.7% 4. 4. now, is that right? Yes, okay. but the trajectory, the right. fall, uh, the uh, uh, declining trajectory is sharp, uh, only in part from winding down wars, but also because of uh, 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 already scheduled budget cuts. And that, those, sh those cuts are okay with you? That's those not cutting too deeply? The Pentagon says we can sustain the basic strategy at that level, going far below that level, it's going to get problematic. There's no evidence that spending at that level harms an economy over the long run. The question really is about the politics mm -hmm. and about the willingness of the political system, the polity, the people, uh, to support expenditure to that level. But that, expending at that level is not going to sap the country's economic, the wellsprings of the country's economic strength. Okay, let's take your, another of your arguments, that there's no evidence that the United States gets dragged into, that the United States, by being all over the world, which is where Bill Wolforth wants us to be all over the world, there's no evidence we get dragged into unnecessary wars. But Professor Wolforth, what was the first Gulf War? There are plenty of people who say the second, the invasion of Iraq in March 2003 was unnecessary. But for goodness sake, saving Kuwait 
Why was that necessary? Jenny, will you help me on this one? I actually, we do get dragged into unnecessary I, wars, I actually don't, don't see that as an example of our alliances dragging us into wars. Um, I, I could pick other examples. Pick, pick a few. <laughs> okay, pick a couple. Pick a couple. Um, I turn to her for help and she gives me none. <laughs> I guess, I mean, what I think about when I think about this question is um, there, there is a, a scholarly literature on this that's tried to, to figure out, okay, do alliances drag right. countries into wars? And uh, it's a, it's you know, it's a growing literature, and I think it has some kinks to work out. But but so far, the evidence is not remotely clear. And if anything, we're not finding a whole lot of evidence. So, this is one thing that that people who um, are making Bill's argument that they that they can point to. Um, the, the 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 key thing is is that what people have found is that people is that great powers have ways to. To, um, to write into their alliance treaties, to basically write in some caution, so, to, to prevent themselves from being entrapped. And this is an important thing that the US needs to think about going forward as we, we have these alliances in East Asia, the ones that I think about the most. Um, we have alliances that really do threaten to entrap us in the future. And so the, the issue is our American leaders talking to those allies about what kind of behavior on their part is acceptable in our eyes and too reckless in our eyes. Mm. So, go ahead, Bill. I was going to say, I, I agree entirely that what we, when we look at the United States in the past, we showed this country is, we see that this country is capable of, of, of doing strategy. I mean, it may be hard for people to believe who watch Washington politics, but we are capable of doing strategy. We are capable of looking forward seeing potential problems, and then working with allies and adversaries to try to structure the situation so we don't get pulled into conflicts that we don't want. I just wanted to say I think there is a f concern of critics of current American foreign policy that may be more, even more relevant than, than that, and mm -hmm. that is that this claim on our need to lead mm -hmm. leads to sort of an endless sense of obligation yes. uh, to countries that are even outside of our immediate security sphere. So an example of this would be Ukraine, uh, but elsewhere, the feeling that if we don't stand up for our for, for people in trouble, for, for countries that are being bullied, even those to which we have no real obligations, will somehow compromise the actual core of, of our strategy, which right. is to sustain these alliances. And so that we're going to get pulled into a leadership role that's beyond our means in a world where, let's face it, almost everybody expects uh, U.S. Uh, global power to be decline relative so to I, China. So you want a strong America. You want us to lean forward. I think that was the title of your piece in Foreign Affairs. So here, let me just put to you a couple of case studies. And I think broadly you're in agreement with Bill on that much at least. Um, almost seven decades after the end of the Second World War, we still have 50,000 troops in Germany. Germany is a rich country. Germany can well defend itself against any Germany could defend itself against Russia today. In fact, Irving Kristol, you remember Irving, the late Irving Kristol, began arguing as early as the 1980s that it was time to wrap NATO up, that the Europeans right through the 70s were still rebuilding after the war, but by the mid-1970s at the latest, they had become as rich as we were, and continuing to provide for their defense simply infantilized them. And here we are, we still continue to provide for their defense, and there's an argument that they have been infantilized. Poland, which is a country that you would think would understand the need for self-defense, spends less than 2% of its GDP on defense. Only France and Britain spend more than 2% of GDP on their defense. So, so one question is just a kind of question of justice. Put yourself in the position of a politician who goes home and hears people say, Senator, Congressman, why are you taxing me at a higher rate than the Polish people are taxing the Poles themselves to defend Poland. Where is the justice in that? But also where is the, so that's point one. Point two is, what good does it do seven decades later to have 50,000 American troops in Germany? William? Well, to answer- He's the, gonna need your help because those are good questions. They are great questions. To answer in turn, however, start uh, is that resentment, fairness is a sentiment. It's an emotion. It's one that I share but it's not a foreign policy. It's not a strategy. It's not a strategic argument. The question is, is it good for the United States or not? I don't believe, and I would never support, a foreign policy that is 
purely altruistic. If it's not good for America, then it's, then it's, then it's not good. But the argument that it is, uh, it is unfair doesn't really sway me that much. I grant that there's a certain You don't care whether it's fair or unfair. Is it effective? It's good for us. So then that brings you to the second part of your question, which is, is it good for us? Um, and I think it actually is, at least on two grounds. One is we get allies. And we get allies that actually defer to us and help us in many, many aspects of international politics. That includes when it comes to issues like cooperation to try to deal with terrorism, when it comes even to the international economy, when it comes to who knows what, it's nice to have friends. And those security commitments keep friends. The second little bit of uh, sort of American national interest that's involved is we simply have a difficult time predicting the future. We don't actually know what sort of strategic threats are going to rise. And alliances are a lot harder to build than they are to sustain. They're a lot harder to create anew than they are to keep going. And therefore, uh, keeping uh, some commitment uh, uh, as a hedge against things going south in the future makes sense, especially when a lot of the costs are actually borne by the host country. Right. So, so for the, all Germans those, pay, the Germans pay for a lot of the food. A lot, for the, a those lot of it. And then there's also some trade-offs where we, they do a little bit more in terms of foreign aid in various countries and peacekeeping things where uh, Europeans tend to take the lead. To buy, uh, In the case of the Balkans, for example, a lot of the nasty, boring, unromantic, unheadline grabbing cleanup work afterwards was actually done by the Europeans to a disproportionate degree, in some sense, compensating for the more uh, hefty military role that we played. So on balance, it seems like a partnership that works and one that I'd be very hesitant to abandon. So Jenny, to turn to Asia, we'll come in a moment to what comes next in Asia, but would it be your view then, we've just been talking about Europe, we still have 20,000 troops in South Korea. Um, every, you can almost set your clock by it, at least once a month, there's some sort of protest in South Korea, we want the Americans out. The younger generation of South Koreans view themselves as South Koreans. They're affluent. Why do we need us? All the arguments apply. But it would be your argument, I'm asking, that for all these seven decades since the war, that region of the world where the Koreans feel a certain animosity toward the Japanese, where the Japanese feel an animosity toward the Chinese, all, by the way, for understandable historical reasons, because of the United States of America, because of our bases, because of our big Navy in those waters, those countries, we, Vietnam did not work out well, but on the other hand, Vietnam, a population of some 70 million is now growing. Those countries have had an opportunity through seven decades to grow, experience prosperity and peace, and that is an American achievement. I, I think it really is. I mean, the, the You buy United all of that. The, the United States... Did we overpay for it? What mistakes did we make? Fundamentally, we got that right? Well, the United States created the security architecture in the region in which it guaranteed the security of some of the key countries. And, and like you said, that has allowed for deterrence on the Korean Peninsula, um, and perhaps for, for restraint also, where we might have seen a, um, one country invade the other um, to, to overturn the, the division. Um, it's, it's allowed for the, the tremendous economic growth in these countries, lifting them out of poverty. The, the Chinese historical experience is just Stagger. astonishing Stagger. to watch mm -hmm. and an amazing achievement by the Chinese people. And this happened in the system that America created. And so we should take a lot of pride in that. Okay. Um, okay. I'm not saying I would have I would continue to run that system in the exact same way as, as the, the, the uh, circumstances are not the same as they were during the Cold War, and that's going to require some adjustments. Jenny has written, quote, and I'm expecting you both to nod your heads quickly on this one. I think this is <laughs> Hopefully I will. The paramount, yeah, the, 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 the paramount question looming over the 21st century. This is the big question. Will the United States and China get along? You agree that that's the big strategic question? I do. Okay. Once again, I'm quoting Jennifer, quote, smooth relations between the United States and China will only be possible in the unlikely event that China adopts an extremely docile national security strategy or in the equally unlikely event that the United States cedes its dominant position in the Western Pacific, close quote. Conflict between the United States and China is therefore likely Correct, Jennifer? Well, we're You're saying You're not that, all that optimistic. Right, the, the piece is not optimistic. Uh, given the trajectory that we think both countries are currently on, the, 
I mean, one thing to think about is there's lots of ifs built into this scenario, right? So there's the giant if of is, is China's economic growth going to continue? And we, we know it's not going to continue at the same levels. Uh, we just know this for an economic fact that, that countries don't grow for that long without leveling off. No tree off. grows to the sky as the right. old saying goes. Right. So, um, so there's the question of uh, how is the economic adjustments that are going to be necessary in China in coming years, how is that going to affect their international security policy? But you're right. There, there is one case in which we could get along quite nicely at least one case, but one of the cases is if China does adopt a docile international policy, and the question there would be, Deng Xiaoping in 1979 says, it is a glorious thing to get rich. Uh, what is the phrase in Chinese, rich nation, weak army? They have not pursued a particularly aggressive uh, agenda, either with regard to building their armed forces or being aggressive with the armed forces they have. They fundamentally focused on getting rich. Why wouldn't they just continue that? Why wouldn't mm -hmm. they let uh, the Americans run the basic architecture of security for another 70 years? Mm -hmm. Well, in the, in the article, the, the phrase rich nation, weak army was actually ours, and it was a play, oh, oh. It was a play on the, the Japanese saying uh, during the rise of Japan, which was rich nation, strong army. Uh, and the Japanese view the, the way to protect their own security was to first grow their economy and then to, as every other great power in the world was doing, to build a large military as well. And so, so basically what we're saying is it would be one option for, for China to consider. And it's got this legacy of Deng Xiaoping's leadership to, to grow rich, to, to hide our ability and bide our time. Uh, to avoid confrontational foreign policies and just reap the economic fruits of that. They have that option, theoretically, they have that option in their own history and experience. But just to, again, throw in a little bit of pessimism, it would be pretty historically unprecedented for a great power to do that. Uh, the, a couple of examples great come to mind. Great powers flex a bit. That's just human nature. That's it, it, just it, what history teaches we, us. We call this option the 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 Japan option, basically. Mm -hmm. Japan, after World War II, selected this option. It said, we're going to grow our economy, we're going to stand back from, from the, the dangers of international security, we're going to buck past to the United States, and we're going to get rich and keep our head down. And the reason that Japan could do that was that it had the United States to, to protect it. China doesn't have an ally like that, so it would be a curious choice indeed for China to adopt that kind of a policy. Two quotations. One is Bill. If Washington got out of East Asia, Japan and South Korea would likely expand their military capabilities and go nuclear, which could provide a destabilizing reaction from China. Close quote. So, the, so there's an argument why China would keep us in the area. Mm -hmm. Here's quotation two. This is from Jennifer. The benign sounding benign sounding, she really means Bill, the benign sounding U.S. policy toward Asia requires not merely U.S. military presence in the region, it requires a substantial degree of military dominance. So you are asking the Chinese, whom we know for all kinds of historical reasons dating back at least a century or a century and a half, if not longer, feel aggrieved. They feel they've been pushed around by other great powers. You, Bill Walforth, are asking them to stomach American dominance in their own region. Isn't that right? Yep. <laughs> I don't know if it's necessary. But is it not too much to ask, Professor? It's, it's not necessarily dominance in the sense of a strike capacity that is capable of invading and taking away the sovereignty of China. It is a capacity that presents limits to China's ability to flex its muscles in its own region, and it's a presence that makes China less perfectly autonomous as a strategic actor than it would wish to be. That is to say, American control over certain land, uh, sea and air lanes give us options with respect to China to coerce it in extremists that it doesn't like, and no great power would like. I grant that. But it seems to me that if we're, we, we do need to negotiate the rise of China. If the power relations continue to change, any strategist will tell you, the political relations will have to change. And we're going to need to negotiate with China. We are going to need to back down on some positions in some places. But the question is, from what platform, from what position do we negotiate the rise of China? 
Do we negotiate the rise of China from a strong position, with strong allies, with strong alliances, with strong military and economic position, or do we uh, negotiate from a position in which we're already cutting and running? And I think that the former that's strategy is... That's your point. Your point is not that we need to stand up to China. Your point is that we're going to be engaged in in an endless negotiation with these people, and we ought to remain as strong as we can at any given moment. If is as that it? it is, if as we are, we're Give going it. to have. There's no. There's there's no way that we will not have to make some concessions, make some changes to our positions on some issues. I'm Make not willing. I'm not willing to suggest we're willing to hand over Taiwan or willing to back out of uh, our commitments. Uh, there's a degree to which we. Um, uh, uh, we might uh, concede um, um, to China a, a, a greater space off its own shore, which we will cease essentially to be able to operate militarily. That is to say, the 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 the, the bandwidth, the the, the space of yeah. the uh, 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 where China has freedom of of action is owing in part to just the rise of Chinese power and the military technical difficulties of denying it that access is going to that, that zone of its operations is going to increase. Jennifer, what's that, what's that little chain of islands that the president was in Japan? Those islands were in the news, what do they call the Senkaku? So the Japanese call them Senkaku, the Chinese call them Daiyaoyu. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Chinese say those islands are ours. Mm -hmm. The Japanese say no, they're ours. And President Obama, during his trip to Japan, said, we're with the Japanese. Those islands are the Japanese islands, right? That's roughly speaking what happened? Uh, he, the he the U.S. A, policy is really quite difficult to understand. Uh, here's basically, my question. Here's my, my question is, why should any American care two hoots about a string of islands where almost nobody lives and no American can pronounce? <laughs> or identify on the map. Why should we care? Why should we have this ornate, complicated policy about that stuff? Right. Um, so, so you could say, uh, what is our position on who owns these islands? Mm -hmm. And that actually we, we don't take a position on, which is interesting. So we right. say, hey, we don't know who owns these, but they are currently administered by Japan. And so the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty requires us to defend them if they're attacked because it's the language is administered by Japan. So, but we actually don't say these are Japanese islands. So you could even <laughs> say your question to, to sharpen it in terms of saying, why should we give two hoots about islands that we don't even say are Japan's? Yeah, so um, why should we? Why should we? So um, Here, hold on. Yeah. Back. Okay. Because you're both being pretty. Let's be out there. You know what? I think you're asking too much. I think you're asking too much of the American people. Here's a piece that I won't hold up to the camera because I'm not sure it'll read well. Well, I'll hold it up for a second. This is a poll that appeared just last week, front page of the Wall Street Journal. Here's the headline. Americans want to pull back from world stage poll finds. Nearly half surveyed in Wall Street Journal NBC poll back anti-interventionist stance that sweeps across party lines. Yes, but Peter, they want and like having allies. They do. Uh, further yeah. polls will tell you, uh, if you dig deeper, they, they, they like a world in which the United States has a lot of allies. So what I interpret that as saying is, concentrate on the core. When your adversary, or potential adversary, I should say, is growing rapidly, when your domestic politics don't allow you to spend as much as you really ought to on foreign policy, when your public is tired after two long wars, when the world landscape is changing, you should focus on the core, the pillars of your grand strategy, which are those allies. So I think what I interpret that as saying is, don't go in search of new dragons to slay, concentrate on the core. Uh, so you'd say that the president was right on Libya, lead from behind was just fine. You'd say he's right in Syria, if you can get the Russians to put pressure on Syria to cough up the chemical weapons, all of this keeping the United States no ground troops, limited military, that's, a pretty, that's pretty effective. I think the instincts are right, the implementation is problematic. You don't, at the same time as you're doing that, then start talking about red lines that you can't enforce. So you've got to get your rhetoric in line with the strategy. If the strategy is, re and I think of rebalance or pivot, not as necessarily pivot to Asia. I'd like to have rebalance and pivot be pivot and rebalance back to the core building blocks of our grand strategy, which are, which are our fundamental alliances in NATO, NATO in our partners in the Middle East, which include Israel, but other partners like Saudi Arabia, and our key alliances in Asia. 
Those are the pillars that uphold the world order. Those are the pillars that uphold the United States prosperity and security. And those are the ones that are in danger if we keep looking for new dragons to slay. So can I comment Please. on this also? So when I read that article about America, Americans wanting to pull back, I, a lot of people passed this around and they said, oh, look at this isolationism in the U.S. And I, I think that's a that's name calling and it's a it's unfortunate because the American people don't want isolationism. Uh, as Bill said, when you look at, at poll data, they really favor these strong alliances that we have and they would come to the defense of these allies. What they don't want is unnecessary, disastrous wars. And so I, I think- So what it they, comes down to is Iraq. Well, Iraq well, no. went wrong and everybody's sick of it and that has, wound, has, has, that, uh, that has exhausted American patience. Is well, that, that right? That's certainly one example. And then you could, you could think of the, the lack of American support for uh, fighting in Libya, for fighting in Syria, for fighting in Ukraine. The, the American people are, are doing, they're reacting to this the way, they, the way Bill is talking about, which is, you know, we need to... We ought to be present. We, we need to be present, we want to be present, but we want to be powerful and not squander our power and not go around the world making enemies. Okay. Uh, what is to be done? The Obama administration, the Obama administration, the administration of resets and peace and let's talk, has withdrawn from Iraq. By the end of this year, they want to be out of Afghanistan. The response to Russia by any, any standard has been measured, incremental, cautious. It's taken pains to keep open lines of communication with China and with all our allies in Asia. And yet, Jennifer herself writes, quote, the very dynamics we describe, China fearing the United States and acting to counter it, the United States fearing those countermeasures and then responding in turn, have not only occurred, but have accelerated during the Obama administration." Close quote. I now guarantee to you, this is fiction, but it's, it's fun. I guarantee that the President of the United States will not only listen to, but obey the next three or four sentences you utter. <laughs> what should we be doing in China? If even Barack Obama, Mr. Caution, Mr. Let's Talk, is discovering collisions with China, what should he do? I think that Bill referred to it earlier when he talked about negotiating the rise of China. And the, the U.S., first of all, needs to understand, uh, you mentioned before the, the line I wrote about the, the U.S. military dominance in East Asia. <clears throat> and what, what that refers to is for this security architecture that we created, the U.S. needs to be able to project massive force into East Asia to come to the aid of its allies if they're attacked. So imagine there's a North Korean invasion of South Korea. We have, as you said, 28 or so thousand troops in South Korea that's, you need to get carriers that's seen there as a, a tripwire, right? right? And so mm -hmm. the, the idea was always that we would be reinforcing. Uh, if there's some uh, naval skirmish between Japan and China, the idea is that we would reinforce. So the projection of power from the United States, a distant power outside of the region, across thousands of miles of Pacific Ocean, is a very difficult thing militarily. And so we need to be able to overcome the, the defender advantages that, that China enjoys in their own neighborhood. We have to project massive force into the area. And so this is, a, this is something that when another country sees us doing, so this requires a bit of strategic empathy here, when, a, when another country sees massive force, another country's ability to project massive force in its direction, that's a rather alarming thing. So your view, your advice to President Obama would be, fine with the empathy, a little more strategy. And the strategy needs to be backed by major force. In particular, I think, I'm assuming this is No, that is our strategy. Well, is it? He's, yeah. he's cutting the military quite, quite sharply. Our Navy is down from a peak of just under 600 battle-ready ships a couple of this decades ago. This is not ago about to... President Obama. This has been our strategy across Republican and Democratic administrations. But I'm asking you what President Obama should do, or President Ob Ob Obama or his successor, because what's now envisioned is scaling down armed forces. Um, the but you can but, live with but it? again, if the question is, can you come to the the aid of the allies if they're attacked. And as we discussed earlier, the thought is that the levels of spending that we envision mean that yes, we still can. Okay. So, so again, what I, was, what I was saying that we need to be concerned about is understand the feeling of vulnerability in China mm -hmm. that, that they have 
in living in this security order. And that doesn't mean we say, oh, China's scared, so we have to be nice to it. It means we need to empathize with it, and we need to negotiate with China. Okay, we have these alliances, which you like, by the way, mm -hmm. for the reasons that you noted. The, the, the Chinese presumably would not necessarily like an independent Japan for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. So we have these alliances, which China, you like, and so we need to still have these alliances be credible. We need to be able to come to our allies' aid if attacked. So how can we keep these alliances credible, but how can we also not alarm Beijing? So the negotiating position is to say to the Chinese pretty directly, it is in your interest, as well as ours, for the United States to remain massively powerful, so powerful that it can project power across thousands of miles of ocean to your region. That's in your interest too. You probably will have to converse with them about individual alliance missions and responsibilities, because they certainly would not see it in their interest if we were coming to aid Taiwan, for example. So you buy all of this? Pretty much. Any nuance you'd like to add in your advice to President Obama? Uh, yeah, I think the Asia policy actually hasn't been so bad. It's not a place where I would, I would be uh, inclined to go after various administrations. I think, the, uh, the pred I think George, uh, George, Bush, uh, uh, George Bush's East, East Asia strategy was very competent, very well run, and I think that the idea of a rebalancing or pivot is pretty good. And overall, they're, they're, they've got a tough job to do. And, you know, no strategies implemented perfectly. I think they're doing an okay job. There's some tough military technical questions about how do you defend uh, these positions in a way that doesn't provoke China. And that's tough. We need to have conversations about it. We also need to resurrect some of those old Cold War ideas about coming to an understanding with your partner slash rival about how to regulate a security relationship that it doesn't get out of hand. And a lot of boring academic exchanges, uh, a lot of conferences where high-minded people trying to discuss these issues, uh, was a, those were regular features of the late Cold War. And we need to institutionalize them more in the China relationship. It may sound boring, uh, may seem picayune, but at the end of the day, that kind of stuff it's might help us, cumulatively might help us structure our armed forces in a way to get out of a kind of 1914 escalation scenario that would be terrifying. Okay. The good news is, is that the, the Chinese are all saying this as well. Yeah, they're so, into it. So when we go to conferences and we talk to our interlocutors in China, they are saying the exact same things. Last question. 1945, Second World War has just ended. The United States has emerged supreme, the richest, the most powerful country on earth. For several years, we even have a nuclear monopoly. Henry Luce, the editor of Time Magazine, writes a famous essay in which he describes the 20th century as the American century. 2014, nuclear powers now include China, Russia, Israel, Pakistan has over 100 weapons, I heard the other day, North Korea, soon enough perhaps Iran, Japan has plutonium stocks that can put together nuclear missiles pretty quick, nuclear weapons pretty quickly. And in just a few years, in fact, I read the other day that depending on how you calculate the figures, this may be the year, but no one doubts that at least in a few years, the GDP of China will surpass that of the United States. In other words, our relative position has been eroding ever since 1945. Will the 21st century represent a second American century? Jenny? Well, first of all, our GDP is not being surpassed by China. That is uh, PPP data, which is not how you measure wealth. That is how you measure right. um, the ability of people to buy things. All right. And so um, the, there's a lot of alarm, alarmist rhetoric lately about China surpassing the U.S. that's entirely inappropriate. Uh, and if you look at GDP per capita, for example. Oh, GDP per capita, not even close, but GDP right. overall, they'll pass us in a few years. No, if you use PPP measurements, which is a, again, a bogus way to, to measure right. this. All so, right. so uh, again, a uh, little Remain digging on calm. that for the, right. for the viewers would be good. Um, I'm not an economist, so I'll let them read, read the people who can explain this better. But, um, so, so when I think of the American century, um, I think of the U.S. instituting this system of free trade, of important international institutions and alliances in, in key strategic reason in key strategic regions. And so that system was by definition designed to reduce the American share of global GDP and global influence. 
It was designed to empower our friends and bring them to the table to share the wealth. If, if that American system can continue, which I've, I think there's a very strong chance that it will, because it's designed to make other countries prosperous, I, I see there's a very strong chance that that system will continue. The big question mark is, will China see an interest in being one of those enriched mm -hmm. countries to sit at that table together? Or will China say, no, we, we want to reclaim our past glory and, and create some new kind of system. And that's a big debate. That really is kind of the crux of it right now. And I, I think China has a very big incentive, as we were talking about before, to, to keep its very prosperous, fortunate place in this system. Build the 21st century another American century? Uh, just following on what Jenny said, the uh, uh, share of GDP of the United States and its allies is about 75%. And it's going to keep uh, declining, probably, if China keeps growing the way it is, and a couple of other the, uh, countries who are outside the U.S. alliance system continue to do so. But it's going to remain a huge preponderance of the world's economy, and especially a huge preponderance of the most wealthy, most competent, most capable, and, by the way, most militarily strong countries in the world. So holding together that coalition uh, on the key central issues uh, would lead you to expect that, yeah, it's going to continue to be in a century with a very strong American imprint on it for a long time to come. Professor Jennifer Lind and Professor William Wolfworth, both of Dartmouth College, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. From the campus of Dartmouth College, for the Hoover Institution and the Wall Street Journal, I'm Peter Robinson. Thank you.